we've got um, the, our next panel going to come straight up. So I'm going to hand the baton back to Karen, who's going to look at the, is going to take the sort of macro picture that we've just had and go one notch deeper with some practitioners in the system who have some inside look at it. Karen, it's all yours. Let me, let me go behind you. I am uh, just waiting for one more of my panelists who is making his way to the stage, which is excellent. This is a good moment to let everybody know that when this panel is over, we all got to clear out of here. <laughs> uh, you got to pick up your stuff, take everything with you, and go downstairs to the auditorium where the rest of the afternoon's uh, sessions um, and entertainment will occur. So just want to give you a little heads up that we are going to be clearing this room out and uh, setting it up for tonight's Leadership Awards Dinner. So just remember to take everything with you at the end of this panel. So with that, I would like to welcome my panelists. Come on up. Don't be shy. Um, uh, we have uh, three panelists who are going to continue the conversation a little bit. Um, in the last, from what you just heard, in the last panel, you really heard very macro perspectives, big systems, what's happening kind of outside of day-to-day -day workings with food. People who aren't touching food literally every day, but touching systems and working within systems that, that clearly impact an awful lot of decisions that are made about our food every day. And that's a great lead-in, and it was designed purposely for the panel that we have here this afternoon. This panel was conceived, and we hope will illuminate and we hope that you agree, that there are, there's another level of very big systems working in food before it does get to the point where we're touching the food, cooking the food, serving the food, eating the food, or taking care of the waste of the food. And that there are systems that these systems that we're going to talk about now are also really actively, operationally making very big decisions that end up being the decisions that you see on your plate and in, your mar in the marketplace. So with that, I'm going to um, introduce our panelists and tell you a little bit about what we are going to be speaking here today. We have on the far, your far left, um, Alexia Howard, who's a research analyst at the, um, for U.S. food at Sanford and Bernstein. She's the U.S. food analyst a global investment research firm. Before joining Bernstein in 2005, she was a consultant with Maricon Associates, working with leaders of consumer products companies and retailers to develop strategies, improve organizational capabilities, and allocate resources to enhance shareholder value. She is representing today the investment banking side of the food system. Her experiences in food and beverage sectors have included developing corporate acquisition strategies, optimizing allocation of marketing, spend across regions and media types, and embedding strategic decision-making capabilities and streamlining product portfolios. And she's going to tell you exactly what all that means. <laughs> we, have, um, we have Stefan Habif from Unilever. Very nice to have you here, Stefan. He holds an engineering degree in food chemistry and technology from the University of Bordeaux in France. He has a PhD in physical chemistry from City University here in New York. I read a little bit about your journey from France to New York and how you, we wouldn't let you go. Uh, you joined Unilever in 1994 and worked as a scientist in skin care research and R&D director for household care in Italy. He's worked in Brazil, in Mexico as well. He is currently the vice president of R&D for operations for the food and personal care companies at Unilever North America. We're really happy to have you here. And finally, and I'm going to tell you a little bit how we set this panel up in a moment, Miriam Arand, with who is the director of the Good Housekeeping Research Institute, and I hope that some of you will take the tour either later today or tomorrow. I haven't been up there yet, but I'm going to make a, a special date, a personal date, to go when this conference is over. Miriam, as the director of Good Housekeeping Research Institute, home of the Good Housekeeping Seal and the Green Good Housekeeping Seal, Miriam oversees a staff of engineers, chemists, nutritionists, textile experts, and scientists that test thousands of consumer products every single year. The Research Institute reviews are featured in Good Housekeeping magazine on goodhousekeeping.com and in Good Housekeeping's Best Toy Awards and many other, many other ways that, the, that those acknowledgments are put into the marketplace. Uh, Ms. Aran also heads up the Good, He's Good Housekeeping Research Institute's advocacy initiatives and investigations focused on alerting consumers to dangerous and deceptive products. So they're each going to speak for a few minutes, and then we're going to do a similar kind of Q&A. Um, one of the things that 
we discussed when we were putting this panel together. I want, what I really wanted from this panel was for us to have an us in the audience, to have an opportunity to hear about how decisions are made that we might not see in the actual product when we're buying that product or when we're eating that product. And these decisions are made on behalf of all sorts of people that are stakeholders, and stakeholders are just people that are you and me, but collectively in a group that are helping impact some of these decisions. So some of the things, I just pulled out a couple things from that very long phone call we had last week, that some comments I'm just going to point out there and let them talk about them and then we'll talk about them together. The notion of rewarding companies for consistent profit over time. There's a certain culture that's behind, a, that's behind a statement like that, that's behind a certain culture of an institution or of a sector. Developing products that appeal and are affordable, another aspect of culture we might not think really describes our culture, but in a way really is the notion of appeal, the notion of flavor, the notion of testing products. Understanding the needs and values of consumers and then representing them in aggregate through media. So there's a lot of different ways that decisions are made about food and get into the marketplace. We're going to hear first from Alexia on the investment banking side of that. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Um, my name is Alexia Howard. Uh, as Karen mentioned, I'm a sell-side uh, equity research analyst and I cover the US uh, packaged food uh, companies over here in the US. And uh, just first of all, before I get started, I wanted to say thank you to everybody who's spoken so far today. Um, right at the very outset, I just started to think about how the language of uh, the food movement is so different from the numbers and uh, bottom line obsession that we have on the investor side. And it was just very nice to hear words like wholesome and joyous. And I was trying to think about how you'd actually get those two conversations to actually start to link up. So my role as an investment analyst is basically to uh, advise investors or money managers on which companies to invest in in the U.S. packaged food sector, so companies like Kraft, Hershey, Sara Lee, and so on. Now, these companies' management teams want to be able to attract money from the investment community. And as such, I believe that the investment community has a pot the potential to have a big role to play here um, in influencing the choices and the strategies and the investment decisions that these companies make over time. The invitation to participate in the conference today did get me thinking about the interaction between investors and management teams and how that leads to some unforeseen consequences uh, in the packaged food sector today. So how do financial incentives uh, shape behaviours here? Food company management teams typically have an annual salary plus an annual bonus, which is usually linked to achieving the company's annual plan, along measures, th things like sales and volume growth, profit growth and cash flows. They also have longer term plans that are typically based on three to five year stock returns and dividend yields versus a group of peer companies. So that's kind of the mechanism on how, how people are paid. Um, the problem is that uh, in, in this sector, investors really care about near-term results and consistency, uh, to Karen's point earlier. Frankly, in this sector, from an investor standpoint, boring is better. Stock returns tend to be driven by whether a company hits or misses uh, a quarterly analyst earnings estimate, um, or whether it's able to grow its uh, earnings per share fairly consistently over time. And only a few investors at this point have really gone beyond the idea of purely financial return to really think about things like sustainability as an added metric here. These companies are seen as very defensive, a safe pair of hands. And so high dividend yields, high cash flows, consistency of earnings are crucial. They're relatively low risk because everybody has to eat. And so there's a, also a growth imperative here. You have to keep growing the volume of packaged food that you sell. It's seen as implying strong categories, um, share gains versus the competition, rather than possibly an unnecessary waste of food or causing or contributing to the obesity uh, problem that we have in the country. And frankly, no one wants to invest in a company that's shrinking. And since investors are paid on whether they, they get their stock picks right, this short-termism tends to become a self-fulfilling prophecy over time. What investors look for in this sector, you know, it is quite short-term. I look at other sectors in healthcare, for example, where people are looking out four, five, even ten years at where is this company heading, and I, I worry a little bit that, uh, that, that the, uh, um, this circle is not as virtuous as it could be. 
Now the problem ultimately with some of these companies is that they have a lot of legacy products um, that frankly are simply not as healthy as they might be. Um, I've written on this subject and really none of the companies in my coverage are, are completely uh, um, come up smelling of roses in this respect. But any CEO that then stood up and admitted that certain products within the portfolio should shrink or even be discontinued over time, they'd be out the door in, a min in an instant. So there's, there's a problem about incentives here and, uh, and doing what's right for the long term. Since the Surgeon General's call to action uh, 10 years ago, food companies and regulators have largely played nice with each other, presumably due to generous contributions and the strength of the lobbying forces, as has already been mentioned this afternoon. Marketing to children is still largely self-regulated by the food industry, although these rules for self-regulation have tightened in the last 10 years. Now, there seems to be a bit of a change going on here, as we saw in April when the interagency working group established by the FTC um, published a set of recommendations on making the uh, rules around marketing to kids uh, a lot more stringent. Now, in response, the Grocery Manufacturers Association uh, called for the agency to withdraw that proposal, citing a lack of evidence uh, between tightening the recommendations and re reducing obesity. So I think what this is highlighting is that we're getting more uh, potential um, confrontation between the large packaged food manufacturers and the regulators, and it's going to be interesting to see how it develops over time. Now, the... Uh, the question then is what do we do? Um, the, the problem is that many of these legacy food products grew up to become some of the US's favorite family brands in a period where kids were much more active and before obesity became an issue. But when added convenience was valued and, and where, as women entered the workforce, this was the, the, these were these kind of, the kind of products that, uh, that developed. Now the food companies are understandably very reluctant to give up these products, saying that they've been around for a lot longer than childhood obesity and the real problem is getting our children to be more active rather than adapting their, their diet to reflect changes in calories needed. So what do we do here? Many of these products are highly profitable, so for management teams to let them wither away would be tantamount to ignoring their fiduciary obligation to act in the interest of their current shareholders. And to give credit to the companies, the focus on new product development has definitely moved into a better realm. Products like Kashi cereals, V8 vegetable juices are definitely receiving a lot more attention than Fruit Loops these days. And the renovation of existing products to reduce salt or eliminate trans fats or reduce sugars has been underway for some time. The real question is, do we want an evolution, uh, that kind of a con gradual process, or do we want a revolution here? We need to come to some conclusions about uh, over what time frame do we want change to take place, and that will probably drive how much the regulators need to intervene. In closing, I'm not sure that there's a silver bullet that's going to solve all the issues of obesity and sustainability in the US food system. However, I do think that there are lessons to be learned from other countries, perhaps especially the Europeans, and from instances where other health-related steps have been taken in this country. What can we learn about the tobacco experience? What can we learn from the calorie count in restaurant experience that started here in New York City in 2008 is, and is uh, now being rolled out to the rest of the country? Change does happen, and, uh, and that's encouraging. There are also hard choices to be made about the pace of change that companies and consumers are willing to accept, and which may determine how much this is a collaborative effort versus a set of regulations. I also believe that investors can play a big role here, and I definitely appreciate your thoughts about how this group might be motivated to act. Thank you. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if this is on, but I just want to say that this is a great lead-in for Stefan, who is now going to tell you the perspective from one of these consumer companies with very yes. beloved brands. So thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. So before I tell you about what I know, R&D, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Unilever and, and what we're doing because that will give you a good context for the way we develop the product uh, in research and development at Unilever. Uh, first, uh, just to say at Unilever, we believe that a sustainable business is a growing and profitable business that delivers positive social, economic, and environmental outcomes. Um, agriculture is very important to Unilever. 50% uh, of our raw materials come from agriculture. We're also very important to agriculture. We uh, buy globally 12% of all black tea, 6% of tomatoes, 5% of dried onions and garlic, and 3% of palm oil. We started our, our uh, sustainable agriculture journey before it was fashionable in 1998. 
And why did we start? It was not from a, uh, there was no consumer pressure at the time. We started because we started to realize that to be able to continue to grow, we needed more of these raw materials, and they were becoming more scarce. And obviously, prices were going up, and if the cost of these raw materials go up, it will limit our growth. So it was really, in a, in a sense, driven by some security of supply that we say, we really need to do that. It's the right thing to do. We're interested in helping society, but at the same time, we want to grow. So we're starting to work and, and, and develop a number of uh, sustainable agriculture programs. And I just don't want to salute my colleague, uh, Jan Kesvis, who's going to be recognized tonight uh, by the James Beard Foundation for the work that he has been uh, doing leading Unilever in that uh, arena. Um, so we started to work on that. It was not only until 2006 that we started to think how can we communicate these benefits to the consumers. So one of these examples, in 2006 we teamed up with the Rainforest Alliance, our Lipton uh, brand team teamed up with Rainforest Alliance, and we made a commitment to source 100% of tea in all of our Lipton tea bags globally uh, from Rainforest Alliance certified source by 2015. And the funny thing is when we started to apply these sustainable practices to tea, we found that the quality went up, yields went up, we were able to sell more product, our sales went up, and the livelihoods of the farmers that are working in this, in this uh, tea plantation improved. Um, a good result also is that all of our competitors are followed up. They, 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 it becoming an entry ticket now to have uh, a certified tea and, and in a matter of a number of years, in the next few years, we're gonna, uh, like, li likely we're going to have the whole uh, industry, the whole tea industry will be uh, completely sustainable. Now, um, why, why um, so, so based on this, on this we, we, in 2010, we launched and we communicate uh, uh, the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, which is essentially uh, a, a commitment that contains 20 time-bound commitments for Unilever to source 100% of our raw material uh, uh, sustainably by 2020 and a number of commitments in the uh, area of, of nutrition, uh, sustainable agriculture, etc. So we made this very public and it's driving us. Why we're doing that? Because we're realizing that if we want to double the size of our company and most of the growth will come from DNA countries, we cannot continue to consume the way we are. So we try to decouple our growth for our, from, from our environmental impact, resulting in us having a goal by 2020 to reduce by 50% our environmental impact. And this is very important because now the consumer is listening. And, and believe me, we believe that this is the only model for a company to continue to, uh, to survive. If, if we don't get this, we will become extinct. If you think that people can break down a regime in 17 days in Egypt, think how quickly they can bring down a company like ours. So we, we, we do that very seriously because it is good business. That's the only way uh, to do this. So that brings me now back to R&D. So to achieve this, it's great. We need to make food that is more nutritious. We need to reduce the amount of salt. We need to reduce the amount of sugar. We need to reduce the amount of saturated fat. We also need to reduce our environmental impact. But in doing that, to be successful, to have an impact on society and on people, we need to make sure that then people purchase our product. And they will only purchase our product if these products taste good and if they get some enjoyment out of these products. So that brings me to R&D. So in R&D, what we've been doing uh, in the way we develop our product, we've tried to integrate all the science, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a chemist, I'm a, I'm a food scientist, so all the science that helps us make sure that we develop products that are safe, products that run down our lines effect, effectively so that they, 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 they are low cost, together with having a product of quality. And for that, we've joined the scientists together with the chefs. So in the company, we have about 300 chefs globally, and we've invented something called chefmanship. We even trademarked it. And it's a process by which the chef works together with the scientist to develop a product that then will be delivered to the consumer. And it starts with the chef understanding the trends out there. They go to a restaurant, they understand the food trends. Then they develop, they develop what is a, a, a gold standard for the product we want to develop. So this is the gold standard. And they work with the, the scientist in making this. So the chef will guarantee that we're not sacrificing the quality of the product, while the scientists will make sure that this is something that 
will be stable, uh, that uh, um, uh, can run down the lines, that also uh, has the right safety from a, from, a, from a consumer standpoint. We also have a team of nutritionists that work together to ensure that we go in the right direction. But to do that, I think we really need to take a stepwise approach. And salt is the best example. If you reduce by 25% at once the amount of salt in your product, your consumer will reject it. We found that by reducing the salt 10% at a time, we essentially wean our consumers off salt. And we've done that quite successfully in our ragu tomato sauce. And we're able to get to the point, we'll get to the 25%, the 30%, etc. But we, did, we do it 10% at a time so that we give the consumer the, the chance for their palate to adapt. We also need, of course, to have new technologies because there's only so much you can do. You need to rebalance the flavors in your product. That's again when the chef come into play uh, to be able to compensate for the reductions of, of salt because salt is also something that gives a great, great flavor to food. So, so my point is it's not an easy problem. We are on the way because for us we found that that's uh, survival. So we really have to do it. Um, but we also need to work with partners. Yeah? And that's, that's kind of my plea, saying, uh, you know, um, um, come with us, join with us. We also, in, in a lot of the work we've done, we've joined with governmental association, non-governmental association that we, we have understood are essentially broadly a force for good. And, but we need to work together to be able to bring this product to market to really have a positive impact on the health and livelihood of the, of the people that we serve. Thank you. Well, I want to start by saying how thrilled Good Housekeeping is to be co-host of this conference. Food is a central focus for Good Housekeeping and has been since the magazine was founded in 1885. Environmental issues are also something we've long been concerned with. As far back as 20 years ago, we published a Green Watch column, and our recent introduction of the Green Good Housekeeping seal, an environmental overlay of the Good Housekeeping seal, and our website, thedailygreen.com, demonstrate our commitment to helping Americans lead more environmentally responsible lives. At Good Housekeeping, our stakeholder is the consumer, and we've been advocating for her, throughout, for her and her family throughout our 126-year history. Just to give you a very brief overview, in the early 1900s, before there was an FDA and before there were any standards for food, food was routinely misbranded and laced with harmful substances like arsenic. Good Housekeeping took an active role in campaigning for the passage of the Pure Food Act, which did pass in 1906. Dr. Harvey Wiley, who championed that act in Washington, actually left his post as the first head of the FDA, which was then called the Bureau of Food, Sanitation, and Health, to become director of the Good Housekeeping Institute. He actually felt he could do more by speaking to the women of America through good housekeeping than dealing with the bureaucracy of the US government. And some people think something's never changed. Uh, the Good Housekeeping Research Institute is the consumer advocacy arm of our brand. I hope you'll all take the opportunity to visit and see our six labs as well as our famous test kitchen on the 29th floor. In our lab, we test thousands of products to determine which rate best and worst. And we're always on the lookout for deceptive and unsafe products and practices, which we don't hesitate to call out. Our mantra is we want to save the reader time, money, and hassle. But who is our reader? Well, she's the average American woman. Good housekeeping is read by one out of every five women in America, one out of every four moms in America. We're dedicated to recommending products, advice, and recipes that she can rely on. So let me tell you how this plays out in terms of food. Before we allow any food product to advertise in the magazine or to get the seal, our nutrition department reviews all the claims to make sure they can be substantiated. We look at claims like an excellent source of vitamin C to make sure the food meets FDA criteria for that claim. And we examine terms like all natural to make sure the food doesn't contain any artificial flavors, colorings, or ingredients, or, or sweeteners. We believe in truth in advertising, insist on accuracy, and put our money where our mouth is. We're the only magazine that rejects thousands of dollars of advertising every month, which is pretty incredible, especially given our economic climate today. Just to give you an example, we rejected one ad for a popular ice cream because it claimed the ice cream had one-third the calories of other leading brands, when in fact it had one-third fewer calories. 
Several months later, the company came back to us, actually admitted that we'd been right, changed the copy in their nationwide campaign, and began advertising with us. When we do accept an ad or a product for a seal, we stand behind it. Good housekeeping's consumer policy is printed in every issue of the magazine. And what it states is if, that you, buy, if you buy a product uh, that becomes defective within two years, we will either replace the product or refund you your money. We believe it's that commitment to the consumer which makes our brand so trusted. The food department is always keeping in mind the realities of the American woman's life. She's time pressured and money conscious. We make sure that recipes are quick, healthy, easy, and goof proof. Like James Beard himself, whom I was lucky enough to interview in 1984 when I uh, was a feature writer for the New York Daily News and who showed me his pantry himself, we develop recipes with our feet firmly planted in the supermarket. Our readers aren't going to specialty stores to shop for weeknight dinners. We stay away from high-priced meats and ingredients and run a monthly item called Five uh, Ideas For, whether it's for biscuits or it's for zucchini or apple cider. We know that women don't want to waste what's left in their cupboard or their refrigerators. But you can be sure that while all recipes are developed with speed, convenience, health, and cost in mind, they must be delicious. Taste rules supreme. And so we triple test every recipe using a gas range, an electric range, and different leading brands of ingredients to make sure that our recipes can re be repl replicated in every American kitchen. Of course, we're in tune with readers, not just in terms of what kinds of recipes we serve up, but how we deliver them. In 2011, Good Housekeeping content is available via a host of media platforms. All of our recipes are published on goodhousekeeping.com, where we also have a magician kitchen tool, a kitchen magician tool. You just punch in the main ingredient, how much time you have, how many, uh, your desired calorie count, and voila, you get a list of relevant recipes. This year alone, we published seven cookbooks, introduced three apps, and redesigned our website on HTML5 so our content can be replicated for tablets and optimized for smartphones. While we strive to encourage readers to cook at home, we're well aware that they're busy and they're actually going to buy convenience food, so we're very real about it. And we know they don't have a lot of time to pour over food labels. So we do the label scouting for them and publish articles like the 100 Healthiest Convenience Foods and the Best After School Snacks for Kids. We make sure that our choices are, meet our nutrition requirements, but that they also are based on the results of our taste tests. After all, there's no point in recommending healthy food if no one's going to eat it. In just about every issue, we publish findings from a taste test of a different packaged food category. We've tested whole wheat pasta, instant oatmeal, low-fat ice cream, light popcorn, whole wheat hamburger buns, Greek yogurt, applesauce, multigrain crackers, and many other foods. If American families are going to eat packaged foods, we want to make sure they're making better choices and they're eating healthy, tasty foods. We strive to educate our readers. We emphasize how important it is to be savvy about serving size labeling. For instance, we pointed out that while a large Nana's cookie is listed as only 180 calories per serving, that serving is for half a cookie. Now, I don't know about you, but I never eat half a cookie. And now that calorie counts are posted in fast food venues in New York City, we conducted an investigation of ice cream shops and discovered that what stores uh, define as a scoop for the calorie count posted is rarely the so serving size you get. And so you may be devouring up to 175 more calories than you think. We try to clear up a lot of the confusion for our readers. Remember when it was easy to just buy a dozen eggs? Well, now you can stand in the supermarket for 10 minutes trying to decide should I buy white, brown, cage free, vegetarian fed, omega-3, and organic. They're confused. We publish pieces that explain terms like free range and locally grown and shed light on such issues as gluten free, which many people erroneously believe is a weight loss strategy. Our myth busting salt feature, which was nominated for a National Magazine Award, pointed out that contrary to what many assume, slashing salt from the diet has not been definitively linked to stroke or heart disease prevention. And at a time when people are again fearful about food safety, in our October food safety feature, we gave guidelines for buying food in the supermarket, for storing and preparing food at home, and when eating out. We're seeing a lot of concerns about health issues related to food. We're finding that the consumer is increasingly eager for vegetarian and vegan recipes, and this year we did publish a vegan cookbook. Our readers are concerned about chemicals when they cook, and so we tested 31 microwavable plastic containers and wraps to see if they contain BPAs and phthalates. When it comes to sustainability, there's no doubt that our greatest consumer advocacy step has been the recent introduction of the Green Good Housekeeping Seal. Why did we launch it? Well, in 2007, we conducted research that showed women want to buy products that are healthier for them, 
her family, and the planet, but they don't know which to trust. The studies show that women are cynical about environmental claims on products and in ads. We continue to conduct studies about environmental issues and found that these attitudes persist. So we developed the Green Good Hasty Seal because it was clear that consumers are seeking guidance in a marketplace awash with green claims. And while there are many green emblems out there, either they're single attribute, like organic, or they do, USDA, or they don't resonate with consumers. Because the Good Hassing brand is so trusted, we felt we were in a unique position to offer the reader guidance in what's very tricky territory. We developed the criteria for our seal with the help of environmental consultants from industry, NGOs, trade associations, and academia. And our criteria take a comprehensive approach and look at a product from the beginning of the manufacturing product uh, process, the ingredients, materials, and composition, through the packaging, distribution, and usage of the product. We take corporate social responsibility into consideration since consumers tell us when it comes to green, they care about that. We request validation for all of our responses. We've been going slowly, developing green good housekeeping seal applications in each product category with input from many experts and beta testers. I'm thrilled to announce today that we've just finalized the application for the green good housekeeping seal in the food and beverage category. As in every category, there are certain factors that automatically prevent a product from being considered. In this category, these factors include if a food contains any artificial ingredients or GMOs. You can check out uh, what we look at, on, at our, on our application and how we weigh different criteria on goodhousekeeping.com. We are transparent about uh, all of the criteria for the Green Good Housekeeping Seal. We believe that Good Housekeeping's introduction of the Green Good Housekeeping Seal comes at a tipping point. We're seeing growing interest from American women in sustainable products. Given that before a product earns the Green Good Housekeeping Seal, it must earn the primary seal, which means it's covered by our warranty, our new emblem offers an opportunity to increase the consumer's trust in products that are making significant environmental strides. Through our SEAL efforts and through the education that we offer in the magazine, on the web, and in social media, we believe that good housekeeping can play a vital role in raising awareness among consumers about sustainability. So thank you very much, and we welcome your questions. Okay, so now we're more overwhelmed <laughs> with, all, with all the people handling all these very important aspects about food, but thank you to all three of you. I think um, you did a great job painting the picture of a couple of really important pressures and um, influences on our system. I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions, and then I think I'm not quite sure now where we are with the agenda, if we, how much time we have, but we'll have a few, few minutes for questions from the audience. So a couple things struck me. Um, from hearing the things that you were speaking about. I think what I, some things I heard were companies cannot just change on a dime. Okay, they just can't literally on a dime. They can't just change quickly. It has to be progressive. Even if you're doing something like removing salt or reducing salt, it has to be done gradually because of palatability and taste. But it also, and if you, but you can't actually even label it, as I understand, if you don't reduce it by a lot. So Unilever is in a very funny position of not being able to get any public marketing benefit out of the salt reduction because they can't claim it in the way that they can do it in such a way that, that people will eat the food. So it's a little mind-boggling. Then we hear things like consumers need to demand it. We heard that from Alexia. If, we, if consumers demand it, then it's more of a message to get some of these companies to start to start to turn on that dime. And yet we hear from Miriam, consumers are demanding it. Which one is it? Are consumers demanding it or aren't consumers demanding it? That's my first question to the panel. How do you know? And I think we need a microphone up here to... On. It is on. Great. Who would like to, how do we know? Well, Are I, consumers demanding it? How do we know? <laughs> I, I think, I mean, you, you know, first you can ask them directly. Yeah, but uh, um, and, and, and in, in many cases, they, they, they are telling you, but you have to be very careful that it is essentially the way they purchase products, the mm -hmm. way they use products for, for us are the sign that yeah, they are demanding it or they will demand it. Because it takes us one or, you know, Luckily, one year, if it's a just a little renovation, but it takes us a couple of years or sometimes more than that to develop new products. Right. And we really need to understand these trends in advance, otherwise mm -hmm. we won't. So we, we really, I think consumers send us signals by the way they consume the product, by the mm -hmm. way they act, and, and then we can, we can develop you know, the, the, the alternatives. But so they, are, they are currently absolutely demanding. So I think Miriam would agree, and I'd like to actually ask Miriam to comment on that about how the, 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 um, the speed with which consumers are sending you messages about what it is they want. And then I would like Alexia to answer from, well, how, mu how much of that and how long over what period of time do, do those messages need to take before your 
your, your stakeholders will actually take notice of it. So Miriam, you first. Well, in terms of sustainability, I mean, pe people are very, very interested, but there definitely are obstacles. They want to mm -hmm. make sure they don't want to pay a higher price. Mm -hmm. they, they still want convenience. They still want the food to taste good, taste still rule supreme. Um, and they are mistrustful. So, you know, that is why we entered into this arena, because there are these obstacles. Um, but they are very conscious. They're getting smarter. I think, uh, I think the media has played some positive role in this, in, yeah. in educating mm -hmm. uh, readers. And they're very concerned about the health of their children. And, you know, the entree point for many into organics has to do with milk, has to do with eggs, has to do with the basics that you feed your family. And those are the starting points. And then... Uh, chemicals. The first category we did mm -hmm. uh, for the Green Good Housing Seal were household chemicals. So they're very concerned about just that environment that they're creating at home. So do you think, and this is the lead-in for Alexi, and I am going to put her on the spot, but I know she can handle it, is, 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 is that where is the gap between everything that you're hearing at the Good, he Good Housekeeping Institute and how, it, how that message gets to investors? Where is the gap? Where is, where is that lag? Uh, I think it's it, ultimately the investors are reacting as and when it has an impact on the company's financial performance. So I, I think what they're hearing, you know, we see um, consumer behavior change, things like Kashi growing from $30 million to over $600 million in the space of a decade. Mm -hmm. We applaud that, but at the same time, it's not that we're really pushing for a pullback on mm -hmm. other things um, if they're less healthy until it actually starts to affect the company's financial performance. I think there's another um, interesting sort of comparison on the sustainability front that uh, in, in Europe, or in the UK specifically, in chocolate, uh, you've, you, you, it actually took the companies make, taking the lead on uh, introducing sustainably sourced chocolate into certain chocolate products in the UK. Then everybody else had to pile in and do it because they made a big deal about it in marketing to the consumers. So it actually created a nice virtuous circle. But I think it, uh, from an investor standpoint at the moment, the bottom line is still the thing that really counts. And until these, these, these issues really start to hit that, the investor community isn't, isn't paying too much attention. Great. So we're going to open it up now. We have, I was given five minutes, two minutes and 10 seconds plus 30 seconds for some questions from the audience. Yes. No, your, your microphone is coming. Here it is. This question is for Miriam. You mentioned that your consumers are concerned about corporate social responsibility and that you factor that in. And I, I can't get Barry's tomato pickers out of my head. So I'm wondering if there's any way that you take into account um, the way that workers are treated in the production of a product. Uh, yeah, there's OSHA. There are definitely some questions related to that as well, the health and welfare of workers. And actually, for instance, if a beauty product, it may not be that when you wear it, it's harmful to you, but if it's harmful to the workers, that, you know, that chemical, that is taken into account. So absolutely, yeah. Great, thank you. Another question? Yes. Hi, I'm Sarah from Food and Water Watch. And just given the last panel that we heard about the economy and food really is different and food is not a widget, right? It takes time to produce it. You guys are driving the markets. Uh, a handful of corporations control almost every aspect of the food system. Given that and that we've just heard that the profit really is the bottom line, what role do you think government plays versus what corporations are doing by themselves? Is this a question directed to anybody in particular on the panel? I would love to hear from everyone. <laughs> well, it's, we'll give it some flexibility. Okay. Um, I, think that, I think there is a role um, that government needs to play, and it is going to determine this, this point about do you need things to happen quickly? Do you really want to take the obesity issue uh, and, and sustainability by the scruff of the neck and make things happen, in which case government does need to intervene? There's a whole host of, uh, I, I guess, possible areas. I think uh, Marion mentioned many of them earlier, things like standards around marketing to children, um, things like uh, front of pack uh, labeling and so on. Uh, food safety legislation and so uh, uh, and uh, those kinds of that 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 whole arena, um, and I think it's it's a choice. If you want it to happen quickly, you've got to regulate. If you're happy to have it happen in an evolutionary way, maybe you can just put pressure and influence the investment community, the consuming community, community through media, uh, and have it play out in a slower way. Great. 
I just want to give one example. It might be a bit out of left field, but we, we, we realize that we need to work very, very closely with government, especially local government, and change the system. Like, for example, we need to do a lot in land remediation because we're talking a lot about, you know, uh, taking down uh, rainforest, etc. But there's a lot of land that today is not proper to, to, be, to be cultivated but can be remediated. But we need to work with governments on that because in the past, for example, a local government would not build a road if there was no commercial interest. And uh, a company would not invest if there was no road. So we need to work together. The same way uh, a, a farmer would not get uh, uh, money from a bank to be able to invest to remediate that land if they didn't have a commercial outlet. Now, if a company says, I'm going to buy your crop because it's going to be grown sustainably, I guarantee that I'm buying your crop, me Unilever, that person goes to the bank, the bank gives them a loan, the government says we're going to invest, we're going to make a road. If we put all these people together, then we can create things that couldn't have been done previously when we all worked in our silos. Great. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Uh, question for Alexia. Um, in the last panel we heard about um, commodities turning into a, an investment class is made. Um, the commodity market is not an effective way for companies to hedge future demand. How do you think bigger food companies uh, will try and manage cost and supply in the future and what do you think that means either for the planet or our health or choice? I think uh, the volatility of commodity costs is here. We've had uh, a dramatic change over the last 10 years with the food for fuel, uh, um, I guess, decisions leading to uh, an increase in the need for global acreage to increase in the production of grains and oil seeds. Uh, and that's led to uh, a great, uh, we have to go into mo more marginal production areas, which leads to this volatility. So it's with us. What I've been seeing from the packaged food company's perspective is they're going to, they're, they're learning. So when commodity costs went through the roof in 2008, they hadn't taken pricing in a decade. They were all stuck in you know, year-long pricing contracts and it was a disaster for them. Now they're working much, um, much more effectively around hedging, around taking prices in bite-sized chunks so that they can, can handle it. Um, they're working much harder on productivity so that they know, you know they're, they're actually going to have some uh, cushion when those commodity prices go up and down. And I think they're working more closely with the retailers to handle it as well. But it's, it's a reality until the marginal cost of production starts to fall through infrastructure development in places like Brazil and around the Black Sea, we're going to have these, this commodity cost volatility with us. Volatility with us. I'm getting all sorts of signals that it's time for us to move on. Um, I think this, I, I hope that you enjoyed this panel as much as I did. I think one of the messages I'm taking away from this is actually we all do have a voice and we should use it because if we don't use it, folks like these are just not going to hear it. So I also heard another thing that I really hope is not true, which is that boring is better. How about boring is not better? And to that, I'm going to once again ask everybody to take all your things, including your pens and your pads, I was just advised, downstairs with you where we are, where we are going to be entertained for a lovely few minutes around a wonderful topic about food. Thank you.